why and how federating data in medicine? Why? Because we face what I call a mandatory oxymoron, medical data sharing. On the one hand, as physician, as researcher, we all understand that we will need to share much more patient data that are currently available to make significant progress in medicine. But on the other hand, as citizen who might get sick today or tomorrow, uh, we also want to protect our data privacy and certainly that of other citizens. To give a scale of this issue and talking about the big data we would like to get access to and that are currently not available, we estimate that in Europe there is about 180 million citizens who are currently living with a brain disorder and possibly about 10% of them, around 18 million, are being treated by one of the 45,000 members of the European Academy of Neurology. So a huge potential of patient data that could be available for medical research, for making progress in the different brain disease, but which today are not available. Another illustration of the gap between what is available today and what we would like to achieve is this very nice initiative called ADNI for Alzheimer's disease. Most of you have heard about it. It has collected deep phenotyping data and especially in neuroimaging, but also genetic on, as you can see, 1400 patient with Alzheimer's disease or MCI and a few hundred control over almost 20 years and for a cost of more than 200 million dollars, which means that for each individual recruiting in that unique cohort, uh, there was a cost of more than $100,000. Definitely something that is not sustainable if we wish to expand our access to big patient data to hundreds of thousands or millions of individuals. But why do we need big data in the first place? Do you really need it? Definitely, with the advance of AI and machine learning, uh, there is a requirement for Zoo's methodology to be applied on big data to fully explore their potential. But I think it's also essential for precision medicine if we understand it the same way, that is, being able to identify very specific patient profile within a given condition. It might be a rare disease, it might be a very prevalent disease, uh, but within which you will have subgroups that will show difference in terms of prognosis, in terms of treatment response. And if you want to develop novel models in those specific patient subgroup, well, then you will need to have a very large population of the condition of interest to start with. In other words, it aims at increasing statistical power, but not necessarily to just identify a new SNP that will require 30,000 uh, patient uh, to show uh, some significance and which will probably then be clinically irrelevant because it will just increase the odds of developing that condition by 1%. No, the statistical power need to be increased in the multiple subgroups that you will identify in that large population. And finally, big data is important to ensure generalizability because it come with the capacity to get information not just from one or a few center but from many centers same for countries and most importantly to also be able to compare and see the difference that might occur between research cohort which are often very selective in terms of patient profile and real life medicine 
So indeed, when discussing machine learning and AI models, we have to acknowledge that they are usually trained and validated on narrow data, often lacking diversity, and likely to suffer from known or hidden institutional bias in relation to the specific recruitment of the center, the hospital, the institution that is leading that research. And we know that is associated with a significant risk of overfeeding of the model that has been developed, not just on the condition of interest, but also on those biases, on those confounding factors that, has specific, that are specific to the institution that developed the model. And here, of course, the model will perform well if it is applied to an independent data set from the same institution, because it will still um, be reflecting the same bias and confounding factor, but it will perform poorly uh, for most other uh, institution where it will be tested. And that's what we want to avoid in as much as some AI derived model might not be uh, readily interpretable and those hidden bias uh, might uh, have uh, an impact uh, on uh, minorities, on different uh, social aspect uh, or characteristic of the patient as has been shown uh, in the recent past uh, in the US. The fewer the number of data sources and the higher the risk of poor generalizability. So overall, what we want to achieve in the field is to be able to develop a model that we learn from and generalize to everyone's data and not to those from a few center only. Now, what are the approach we can use? Well, for decades, medical research, when multicentric, uh, was using centralized data sharing, which come with a number of advantages high quality of data curation and harmonization, strong performance of analytics. You control every step of your research and data analysis, and that's nice, uh, but it has disadvantage. It's often an expensive framework. We saw the example of ADNI, uh, and in particular for long-term maintenance, it definitely does not scale well. If you want to incorporate data set from a very large number of centers and just not a few. But the main problem is the one I uh, acknowledge in the beginning of my talk is that um, it faces more and more stringent data privacy, regulatory and ethics issue. And for some data of interest, it's just impossible to centralize them anymore. There are other approach, one that I will not um, uh, explain in detail, but just to mention it, the so-called institutional incremental learning, where the model and the learning will go through several institutions step by step to incorporate information from those different data set without sharing, centralizing the data. Uh, yet, this approach is associated with the risk of so-called catastrophic forgetting, where the model eventually relied more on the last data set uh, that was analyzed than on the first one. And the greater the number of data set, the higher the risk of such catastrophic forgetting. That leads us to our main topic today, federated learning is an analytics, which is indeed the alternative that seems to be the most appropriate to this topic. Federated analytics mean that you're moving the analytics, the model, the algorithm to the data rather than the opposite, rather than moving the data to the central station where you will perform your computation, which means the patient data never leave their host institution, that the main message only aggregated finding that are, are being generated through the algorithm that you are using locally in your hospital or the model update are being sent to a central server that come with another important data privacy uh, um, uh, effect is that as a participant 
you have access to your own data in your hospital, but you have no way to see, to get access, to copy the individual data from other institutions participating in the Federation. This also come with a very low risk of re-identification. Theoretically, there is such a risk uh, if you perform multiple queries and there is this notion of modal inversion, but honestly, it's a very low theoretical risk. And it can also be nullified by adding uh, other more sophisticated data privacy feature that will be discussed tomorrow in detail, uh, such as differential privacy, SMPC, or homomorphic encryption. So overall, it's really an optimal solution for building very large scale hospital based data collaborative network. Sustain because to accomplish this, you will need to organize an infrastructure, a specific IT infrastructure. This is a little bit complicated. This will be discussed also in the next few days regarding the medical informatic platform uh, from the HBP. But once it's done, once it's done, it's sustained and it can be used to address multiple studies on multiple conditions and not only for clinical neuroscience, but for any other uh, topic of interest in your hospital. The notion of federated learning and analytics is not new from a mathematical perspective, but its implementation in uh, medical research is really recent. And as you can see through this PubMed hits, uh, it's primarily in the last two years that we've been seeing significant uh, clinical research study that have used that approach. And I want to illustrate this with one that was published just a few weeks ago in Nature Medicine, and I think it's a landmark. And of course, it's about COVID-19. So in this case, the objective was double. First of all, establish a new predicting model, um, in particular of the risk of requiring mechanical ventilation early on after admission. But it was also looking at the performance of federated learning as compared to other approach, as you will see in a minute. Here we're talking about 20 hospitals from five continents that could contribute to a total of 16,000 patients. And interestingly, hospital with very heterogeneous population, which is a strength, which is an asset. In that case, indeed, we want through federation to be able to take into account that heterogeneity. That's what will allow us to eventually uh, provide models a knowledge that is truly generalizable. For the study itself, they've been looking uh, through machine learning uh, at uh, chest X-rays, plus some vital sign, demographic and laboratory value. And what they wanted to establish, it's a score that they call the Cori score that will indeed predict at 24 or 72 hours after admission whether the patient will need specific type of uh, ventilation and in particular mechanical ventilation two conclusion on that slide the first one is that the model established uh, through this federation was very performant uh, you can see its performance here in terms of value of area under the curve for the federated learning FL in each of the 20 centers that are being displayed here. And this corresponds to the green bar. The blue bar corresponds to the performance of a model that will be established using the same of values and the same calculation, but only on the data set of each center. And as you can see, using information from 20 center, uh, provide a more performant model uh, in all the centers and sometime with a difference in performance that is really very significant, like for center 20. So 
the first conclusion is that by being able to federate data from a large number of centers, you achieved a model that is better than if you will have established the model with your data set only. And this reflects, of course, primarily uh, the fact that you have been using a much larger volume of information, but also possibly its diversity. Another analysis that was done was to compare the average performance of the federated learning to uh, how, uh, a model that will use data from all sites except your hospital will perform and does correspond to the blue circle. And here it is plot against the number of cases uh, for which each center contributed. And you see again that the federated learning performed better overall, performed better for every center, and in particular for a center who had a smaller data set. Another way to uh, interpret this finding is to say that not only federated learning improve the performance of the predictive model in every center, but the capacity that you can incorporate your data in that model and not just use a model built on other center data uh, is also improving significantly the output. Now, one question you might ask is whether this type of approach to federated learning perform equally, equally well or less well than um, a model where all the data will have been centralized. And this issue was addressed by another recent paper um, that actually used machine learning for uh, distinguish normal brain tissue from brain tumor or MR images here in 10 hospital. And basically, that's what they've been showing. CDS mean collaborative data sharing, but this corresponds to centralized data sharing. So all the data from the 10 hospital has been centralized and analyzed together through a classic machine learning approach. And this gives the best performance. The federated learning is in green here, and as you can see, it's very close. Maybe a little bit less performant, but very close. One could conclude it's almost comparable. And of course, uh, it enables to take advantage of all the benefit of federation in that case, uh, which means not having to deal with the data privacy issue and the generalizability we mentioned previously. The two other lines correspond to the institutional incremental learning that I've been uh, uh, quoting previously and that we are not going to detail further, but you can appreciate that the performance of this other approach is much less performant. Let's move now to the medical informatic platform. It's an open source free of use software that has been developed by the Human Brain Project and now is being further incorporated in eBrains and which is dedicated to data federation and federated analytics. It is privacy aware, it is GDPR compliant. And so we create an organized federation and each federation is built around several nodes one node per participating hospital where we will have a data set of interest which are connected to a central node which is placed on eBrains. In each hospital a node a MIP includes some curation tool with the data set and the analytical tool as I mentioned we move the analytics to the data rather than the opposite. It has already been styled in more than 30 hospital in Europe and contain more than 20,000 data set covering various brain disease, in particular dementia and TBI, which will be presented tomorrow. And uh, it is now developing a very ambitious project coordinating by the scientific committee of the European Academy of Neurology and the European Stroke Organization, with Valeria Caso and Yorgos Sivgulis being the scientific coordinator of this project, 
aiming at federating seven national stroke registry that could account for more than half a million patients overall. And this is really a typical use case for setting up a federating approach because zoo stroke registry, they cannot be centralized. They cannot be exported outside the country uh, for uh, obvious regulatory reason. Most importantly, the MIP has been framed for you. It has been framed from clinical researcher, which mean uh, both in terms of ergonomy and easy to use uh, characteristic. Uh, it really target what I will call the data controller. The people who have the capacity, if they have the motivation, if they have the incentive to collect, curate, organize data from their patient in their hospital and eventually decide to federate this data set with that of other hospital. Um, you access the MIP once it's installed. Uh, you access it through, uh, through the web. And it's very simple because it has only three frame. The first frame, which is called the variables, allow you to select the federation you will be working on. You need to be accredited for that federation. The data set that could contribute to your analysis. Again, you need to be accredited selectively for each data set you might use. And then what you see, all those circles, all those bubbles, it's the data model. Those are the variables that are available for your data set. In that case, we have diagnostic, neuropsych, demographic, and so forth, and all the brain anatomy. This is a dementia use case, uh, including any data you will see. It's regional brain volume from different brain region that has been measured on MRI. So you can select, you will see that uh, more dynamically in a second, you can select the variable of interest and then move to the second frame, which is the analytics. And once you've done that, you perform basically descriptive statistic. Uh, for the different uh, uh, data set that you've been selecting, in that case, the ADNI public data set, uh, uh, data set from Lille in France, from Chuve in Lausanne, from Brescia in Italy. And you can see the potential difference between those data set in terms of number of individual, their mean MOCA and their mean age and the mean volume for the different a brain region that you've been selecting. And once you've done that, you can move to the experiment, which is where you have the analytical tool. This is a third frame where you will be able, again, to select data set of interest and also the algorithm that are compatible with your selection of variables. Those are the one displayed in blue. And here we will perform, let's say, logistic regression. And after a few seconds or sometime minute, depending on the complexity of the analysis, you'll get the result. But let's see that dynamically. So you need to get to your to the web and use your brother and then get uh, uh, accredited with your password. And now you select your different variables just by clicking. Um, moving to the neuropsych, selecting the MOCA, then selecting a few brain region of interest. In that case, we'll take the right hippocampus, the left hippocampus, the right uh, and the left uh, anterior area. Now, once you have done that, you can move to the second frame, select the data set of interest, I will keep only two, the public ADNI, Lille, and Lausanne. And you can also use filter. Uh, in that case, I'm transforming a polynomial into a binomial variables. So to be able to make a logistic regression. And I have my descriptive statistic. And then I move to the third frame. I want to launch a logistic regression. I want to contrast Alzheimer's disease with MCI in that case based on the selected variables and i'm now launching that query which means that what is happening now is that the same logistic regression is being run on three different data set located in three different mip in three different places and hospital and eventually as you see after 
a few seconds, I got the end result, which I think it's quite spectacular. So in conclusion, uh, I do strongly believe that progress in medicine and digital health require that we get access to a much larger volume of patient data than those currently available. Federated data, federated learning offer an optimal solution to achieve this goal and very large scale privacy preserving real life health data sharing. The MIP is one option, I believe one of the most advanced option specifically developed by the Human Brain Project and eBrains to offer European Neurology Department, yourself, the clinical researcher, the data scientist, a sustainable free of use access to a GDPR compliant platform for performing such federated data analysis. Sustainable because, as you heard about eBrains, the MIP will continue to develop and being maintained in what we hope will continue to represent the main IT infrastructure, digital infrastructure for European research in neuroscience. I thank you very much for your attention.